It's a real pleasure to have you be with us. Our topic today is the theology of work, and uh, the person sitting next to me is familiar to many of you. If you, if you attended chapel this semester, um, Bill spoke earlier, Bill Hendricks. He has come on board as the uh, acting executive director for Christian Leadership. So the center is now made up of the, of the two of us working side by side and in coordination with each other to deal with the themes of life and theology that the center deals with. And so we thought uh, today's the cultural engagement chapel, but it's also the faith and work chapel that we do one of these each semester within our series of four in any given semester. And so our topic today is the theology of work. And what I wanted to do is to introduce the topic by introducing you to a website uh, that, will, that uh, Bill has done some work on along with many others. I just came back from a faith and work workshop uh, in Boston held at Gordon-Conwell. Well, they hosted it. It was actually at a hotel. And uh, which gathered all the major faith and work players from around the country. Uh, to talk about faith and work, and uh, it was a two-day conference. Uh, Mikel Del Rosario was there with me from the center and uh, getting up to date. They're coming to Dallas in two weeks, so they may be coming to our campus in, in, two, sorry, in two years, and they may be coming to our campus in two years as well. So, so I thought we would kind of update on what's going on, and one of the major things that they introduced, Bill, was this Theology of Work project website. This is theologyofwork.org. That's all one running phrase. This is often the case with the URL. Theologyofwork.org, a biblical perspective on faith and work. And if you just overview this page, you can see it's got a section on calling, a section on ethics, a section on excellence, a section on workplaces. And it actually plans to run through an exposition of the entire scripture, both Old and New Testament, all matters having to do with work and theology. Uh, there's a vocational overview. And for those of you who ask, well, what in the world is the theology of work? After all, we don't have a systematic theology class here called laborology. And so, uh, so if you ask what that, what that is, I'm going to run a little clip here from the page that is going to int hopefully introduce that to you, but I've got to get there first. Um, this is something that the, uh, the radio show for the radio Bible class has run. That's Matt DeHaan. And you're going to recognize probably one of these faces. Some of you will. Some of you won't. Uh, the per one of the people they're interviewing is Haddon Robinson, who used to teach here in the pastoral theology department. In fact, he, t he taught me homiletics, so it's all his fault. So, uh, <laughs> so here we go. Let me, let me run the beginning of this. <clears throat> Today on Discover the Word, be part of a conversation about what it means to be called by God to do something. I have a young friend who's considering the military. He said he feels called to help people, and that being a medic in the military seems to be the direction God is leading. Other people I know who are serious about their faith are struggling with relationship decisions and career choices, and they use terms like knowing God's will and following God's leading and being called to do something. So do you feel called to do what you're doing today? Should you? Let's talk about that on Discover the Word next. So that kind of introduces the theme. Normally when we think about the term calling, Bill, we think about being called to ministry or maybe being called to the faith. Um, so what's happening with, with, with the word call? Is, is this a healthy direction we're thinking about going when we raise the issue of calling into all kinds of other areas? Well, if we limit it to just those categories, then we end up in this bifurcated world where people get called to ministry, but then people aren't called into sales or called into medicine, and it creates huge problems for people uh, in the church and in our culture because they think that there must be something wrong with me. God's got some special thing for this ordained person, but me, you know, as my dad used to say, uh, the people in ministry are paid to be good. The rest of us are good for nothing. So, <laughs> can you always count on your dad to say something, no. right? <laughs> yeah, uh, even from the grave. <laughs> that's exactly right. So, uh, um, yeah. So, I, I do think that one of the interesting things that's happening in our time today is that there is a, a lot, a lot of attention being paid to the theology of work, and that I remember when these uh, topics used to come up. Uh, 
when I first came to the seminary, um, some of the faculty will remember Bill Garrison, who who uh, was on the board and used to talk about this a lot. And it was like he, his view was is that is that uh, those conversations worked well until he got to 3909 Swiss, and then and then sometimes they kind of went through a, a black hole. But but there is a sense in which the where God has us and where God leads us, no matter where He has us and no matter what He has us doing. Um, has has value and is a ministry and so it's it is the breaking down of the secular sacred divide that we're talking about in fact couldn't we say that the secular sacred divide is actually a product of a cultural way of looking at work that is very unbiblical it's totally unbiblical in 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 the new testament it's very clear christ is lord of all and the word all is all inclusive and so that means work as well as every other category of life and he's either Lord of all, as they say, or he's not Lord at all. And so we can't just make him Lord of church things. We have to make him Lord of everything, which includes day-to-day -day work. And so, and, and this calling often starts off in, in Genesis 1 and 2 with the, uh, with the call to really manage the creation. Absolutely. The very first words that God speaks to human beings after he creates them has to do with their work, which I always find both fascinating and instructive. It, it tells you something about the importance of work to our day-to-day -day life, that we're here to do work. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, rule it. The word be fruitful uh, is very important. You know, the world on its own is not fruitful. I don't know when the last time you looked at a mountain of ore and saw a Mercedes-Benz come hopping out of that mountain. I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. The world on its own simply provides raw resources. Only human beings can add value to turn those resources into something useful. And to that end, God has called, in a sense, each one of us to a particular thing that he wants us to do by, way, by which we add value to the world and make it fruitful and thereby carry out that mandate. Yeah, I sometimes like to say that, that what we've done is we've separated the Great Commission from the Creation Commission, and in that process, we've created a division that really isn't a very healthy theologically. Well, you asked, you know, how does this whole interest in, in calling seem to be heightened today? Mm -hmm. I actually think it's a function of something that happened in the world about 75 years ago that was absolutely unprecedented, which is that the nature of work literally changed. Prior to uh, basically World War II, most all the work in the world was done on farms and factories. And in those economies, one strong back is as good as another. You could just plug and play people. You don't have to worry about calling. Uh, you, you just put people in and they do what they're supposed to do. And a very few rare people, you know, like sometimes during the Renaissance or go back to fifth century Greece and the philosopher kings and so forth, they might use their minds but for the most part, people work with their hands, with their bodies. But then comes the rise of knowledge work, and that changes everything, because the locus of work moved from the land to the mind. Everybody in here is a knowledge worker. Now, some of you may have grown up on farms, or you're, you, know, you, may, you may have even done a work in, in a factory somewhere, but you're here at seminary because you're training your mind as well as your heart, and that's the thing about knowledge work, is that access is more of our personhood, which means it's terribly more interesting and more sophisticated, and it allows us to get not only our bodies involved, but our minds, frankly, our souls as well, our hearts, which is wonderful. But, but the problem is we're only 75 years into a grand experiment in this world, and we really still don't know how to educate knowledge workers, how to place them for effectiveness, uh, how to manage them, how to organize them, how to incentive them. The last 75 years have just seen a series of experiments in that. And I think we're making some progress, but we've got a long way to go. But one of the key pieces is that we now have options. Because if you can't just plug and play people from the side of the worker, they say, well, where should I plug in? What should I be doing? Well, that's the issue of calling. What has God called me to do? What is, is his will for my life? I don't think people asked that question very much, you know, a thousand years ago. They, 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 you know, if you grow up in a family, you're pretty much going to do what your dad does. Or you get married and have babies. I mean, there's not really options about it. We have options. 
we, we have choices and we, we then have to think meaningfully about what am I called to do? What has God put me here to do? So it makes a big difference whether you think about a job as a job or you think about a job as a calling. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's more, you see, than just about making the money. Yes, everybody needs to get paid, but most people, they're really looking for what we call a payoff. That is, they, they're looking for something that feeds their soul. And of course, the reason they're doing that is because Jesus was very clear. Man does not live by bread alone. Now, he does live by bread. We, we have bodies, we have to feed them. That's not enough. Yeah, There's it is recommended, ha- isn't it? It is recommended. <laughs> But if we, don't, uh, if we don't feed our souls, then life doesn't make sense for us as human beings. And I, I certainly realize and value the fact that, that our identity is always found in Christ. But to put a finer point on that, what, what in the work that I do, which has to do with giftedness, what's fascinating to me is the way people just, they come alive, if I can put it that way, when they do this thing that God has uniquely made them to do so when you match giftedness with vocation then you've got a you've got a winner yes yeah well um and the by the way the microphones are in the aisles Uh, we'll be taking questions here shortly so if you've got a question you want to ask bill do feel free to come to the microphone so we know you have a question to ask um explain how you got involved with this because the uh, theology of work yeah the theology of work project i mean did you work at it or or, i mean how did how did it happen (laughs) well i think the way it happened kind of goes like this Uh, shortly after i graduated from seminary i encountered a guy who's also a seminary grad named doug sherman and the two of us had a ministry called career impact ministries and randy frazee was also part of that and we were trying to do an integration of faith and work. And uh, we had the opportunity to write a book together called Your Work Matters to God, which was, came out in 88. And believe it or not, until NavPress folded into Tyndale last spring, it was still in print all, after all those years, which just shocks me. And it was still selling. So you know, I don't know if that's good news or bad news. Maybe it's bad news, something that's 25 years old is still on reading list and you know, hopelessly out of date. But <laughs> be that as it may, uh, the, where the theology of work came about is that um, every 25 years, somebody writes a book like Your Work Matters to God, and it sort of reinvents the wheel. You know, We go back to scripture, we get a concordance, we look at all the verses on work, we try to cobble together, what does the Bible say about work? And somebody writes a book on it, and everybody, everybody goes, ooh, this is really new and neat. He said, well, actually, somebody else wrote on it 25 years before. So we just reinvent the wheel. And the idea was, what if we could break that cycle? What if once and for all, we could pull together a group of scholars who actually believe the Bible and go through every book in the Bible and come up with a baseline for, this is what the Bible basically says about work. So that if you're a pastor or a seminary professor or a college professor, or you work with people in a particular area of the workplace, you don't have to start from scratch. You've got something that's pre-digested online that's a common license that you're free to use, you're free to download, you're free to reprint as you, as you wish, and turn it into Bible studies, turn it into sermons, turn it into whatever, um, that that would be useful to the body of Christ. And of course, being online in sort of a wiki type format, over the years it could be updated, things could be added, And so what the Theology of Work project uh, has there, uh, we went through every book in the Bible and said, what does this book contribute to our understanding of work from God's perspective? Guess what? We discovered that some of the books in the Bible, they don't really talk about work. And that's important to know. They have other themes. But in addition to that, we took about 18 theme articles, and you mentioned some of Mm -hmm. them, the issue of calling, uh, profit, uh, justice in the, in the workplace and so forth. Um, and these can be added to over time. And so I think the way I got involved was that to pull this project together, they needed a steering committee to pull that together. They polled about 200 uh, Christian leaders around the world and they asked them two questions. Number one, when you recommend resources on work, what do you recommend? Books to read, other kinds of things. And secondly, if we do this project, who would you put on the steering committee? Well, your work matters to God somehow came up near the top of the list, hmm. you know, which was a, a tremendous you know, compliment, I suppose. 
And next thing I know, somebody's calling me saying, hey, Bill, we got this project going, and twice a year we'll, we'll fly you to Boston, all expenses paid, and you get to sit in a room with some really smart people and talk about work from God's perspective, you know, and, and you're there in Boston so you get seafood. <laughs> I'm like, what's to say no to? That's exactly you know? right. Yeah, clam chowder. So I was in special. right from the get-go. Yeah, that's great. Look, uh, uh, we weren't planning on doing this, so i got to direct the people in the back here. Is there? Can, I, can we get the website back up that, that I have on the computer? Um, because I want, I, we, I didn't go through and show kind of what's on this page, which is which is good. Not only do you have the individual books that we're talking about here, but we also have special articles built around specific passages designed to show where work comes into discussion in Scripture. Uh, you can see, um, you know, several Old Testament passages become significant as you just scroll through this. And they also have interviews with key people who are involved in theology of work uh, projects of one kind or another. Um, I'm working my way and I'm hoping that it pops up. Uh, they've got, a, for example, they have an interview of, with, here, with Catherine Leary Alsdorf. She keeps popping further on down the page as more <laughs> passages come up. But she ran the Theology of Work project for Timothy Keller's Church uh, Redeemer uh, mm -hmm. uh, in New York. and. Uh, and actually was an executive herself who came to the Lord and uh, then uh, in the midst of her involvement with the church, they launched this project. She left her job in order to really, um, what would be the word, to encourage people who are in the workplace that their jobs actually matter. And, and there's a theme here that's important. We aren't just talking about doing evangelism at work. As important as that as is. As important right. as that is. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about theology work. So we're not talking about how to be a, well, we aren't talking about how to witness to Christ while at your work. We're talking about how to be a witness for Christ by how you do your work. The work itself matters. Exactly, exactly right. And so that is a uh, slightly different take and a slightly different emphasis on things. So I'm going to let you fill that out. What, what's that difference between simply saying, well, I'm going to work and hopefully I have time, uh, time and opportunity to talk with my colleagues about Christ versus viewing your work as a calling? Well, the difference is a sense of purpose, meaning, and direction and, and the belief that God has put me here precisely because he wants this transaction done well and ethically. He wants this tooth filled properly. Um, he wants this child taught well. Um, he, he wants this road paved correctly. In other words, when God says make the world fruitful in Genesis, he means make it work as well as it possibly can. And even though we now live with a, a curse, uh, the work itself is not cursed. It's, it's the ground that was cursed. And so work is tough and there is toil. And of course, in a sinful fallen world, we work with sinful fallen people among whom we as well are sinful and fallen. So guess what? You know, we get lots of conflict and, and, and we get our noses out of joint and, and all kinds of stuff. Nonetheless, there's a redemptive aspect to work. That, that, that Christ is using our work itself to sanctify us. And the, the difficulties that we run into, the challenges, you know, even going bust in a business can have a redemptive purpose if we bring it before the Lord and say, Lord, show me what you have in this for me. Do something to glorify yourself in this. That's a, that's a world of difference from simply going to work to live for the weekend or mm -hmm. just to go to work and it's all about me. I'm gonna rack up as much stuff as I can or I'm gonna get as much power as I can. It was a very selfish way of living. It's, it's living your work for Christ, which of course is what Paul stresses again and again, that do you work heartily as unto the Lord, knowing that it's from the Lord, he's your boss. It's from him you receive the reward of the inheritance. I, I think it's interesting, when, again, when talking about this detachment of the creation commission from the great commission, that often we don't ask ourselves the question, why does God actually save us? And, and what I mean by that is, is, is the point simply, okay, I've got my ticket to heaven and now I'm waiting until, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in eternity? Or is there actually a, a part of salvation that deals with how I live, living out the way I've been designed to live, living Absolutely. out the way in which I was created to live, living in a way which contributes to what God is doing in the world and what he designed people to do for one another in the world before him, all those kinds of questions. And the moment you ask it that way, all of a sudden 
what your salvation is for in terms of this life becomes a very, very important feature of thinking about why you walk with God. There's, there's a passage that really drives this home, drove this home to me, and it's a passage involving John the Baptist. It's in Luke chapter 3. It's only in Luke. All great things are only in Luke. And so, um, <laughs> and, and so uh, the, after John has preached his message about baptism for repentance, um, the question comes up, John, what shall we do? It's actually asked three times by three different people. Now, if I were to ask you in terms of repentance, when you, what relationship do you think about when you think about repenting? I think most anyone on the street or most anyone in the church would say the relationship I think about is how I'm interacting with God. And yet, in all three cases, every answer that John gives to that question involves how we're relating to another person. It has, in other words, the, the point is, is that the way I interact with God then ends up inevitably impacting how I'm interacting with other people. And it's through, it's through their work. It's through their work, exactly right. Exactly right. And so, you know, the soldier is told not to abuse his power, for example, in, the, in that answer. Not one word is said about how I'm relating to God. Everything about how I'm relating to God is translated into how I'm interacting with others. And that spoke volumes to me about about what it is that our that our walk with God is supposed to generate it's supposed to change the way we function in the world before God and in relationship to others and I think sometimes we sell that short well you asked you know what is it that God saves us for I think part of the answer there gets into what I like to call incarnational truth it's a mystery but we serve a God who for some reason that we don't understand he seems to want to see himself in human form. Not only in Christ, but in every one of us. Because we are, after all, each and every one of us uniquely made in his image. That is, we image God. There's something he sees in you that he doesn't see in anybody else. But what he sees there is a little picture of himself in human form. Mm -hmm. And he takes great delight in that. And of course, the only person in, the, in anywhere that, that, that is worth God's delight is God himself. So when we live out the way he's made us, he takes delight in, in that activity because he does that same activity in an infinite way. He's seeing us glorify him by doing that activity in a finite way. So to put that in work terms, it, it really is as if you know, somebody comes and they serve you, say, as a waitress. It's as if Christ himself is there to serve you as a waitress if that waitress has put herself in the power of the Holy Spirit to do her job, to benefit you, to glorify God. It's as if Christ himself was waiting on me. It's as if Christ himself is flying this plane. It's as if Christ himself uh, is, is um, taking my, my uh, garbage away. Every job has dignity every legitimate job, but all human work has, has dignity and value. And, and, and God himself wants to see himself in the people that do that work. So a very, very important theme. I thought I saw someone standing up to ask a question, and if you have a question, you'd, okay, good. Go ahead. I think you answered my question already. Okay. But I just want to ask a very basic question. Uh, according to my understanding about the Bible, when people are caught by God, usually in the Old Testament or uh, New Testament, they basically hear what God calls them to do. But here, what I hear, what I heard from your conversation is, we, we match the work. You, were, you use the word, you see the people come to a life. So it seems like the calling, we are, we are abandoned, not abandoned, we just because, is it because we cannot hear God's voice? That's why we seek whether we come alive. So that's the calling. That's, that's how we're going to find out if that's our calling. Okay, so are you asking, are you asking how can we identify our calling? Or are you asking, uh, are you no, asking? I think my, my question is why we're taking this perspective. Why are we taking this perspective? Yes. Okay. You want a shot at this? <laughs> Well, I believe that calling, in that sense, begins the moment God calls us into existence. Uh, God, God calls us into, each and every one of us, into existence. When he does that, he has something in mind that he wants. And, and whatever that is, that's what I need to, quote, become. But that's actually what I already am. Now, we're born into sin, and so, yes, 
people don't hear God's calling on their life until by grace, Holy Spirit quickens them and they, and they hear, oh my gosh, God's calling me to himself and, and, and they'd have a new relationship with God. Now they're, they're in a position to really start to hear what is, what is my intention for you, how you spend your time. And to me, Paul is one of the best examples of this. Because every time Paul talks about his calling, for instance, in Romans 1, he says, Paul called as an apostle. It's like the calling and the apostleship go hand in glove. What's fascinating is about six verses later in Romans, I think it's 1, 7, he says to you, who are also among the called. He didn't say you're apostles. He just says you too are called. So, you know, we have a calling just like Paul has a calling. He was so clear, and he says it in several places in the New Testament, who called me from the womb to be an apostle to the Gentiles. It's like his identity was virtually wrapped up in that call. And, and I believe that there's a way to find out for each and every one of us, you know, what, what that kind of, the, what the nature of that work is that God has given for us. Yeah, I, and I tend to think of it this way. You know, it's asking the fundamental question, why does God have me here now? Um, why has God put me in this place, in this situation? And I think when you think about it that way and you, and you believe that God's providence is not, you know, accidental, that, it, that there actually is some purpose and design and point to it all, uh, then, then you sense that. Now, that's not to d diminish the places where the scripture goes out of the way to say, <laughs> God made a special point of making, you know, an iPhone call here and, uh, and, you know, and making sure he got the person's attention about doing this specifically or that specifically. But I, I think it's, it's stepping back from asking the question, is there anything that God asked me to do in life that is designed to be irrelevant, if I can put it that way? Um, and, uh, and I think the question is for people who really believe that God is involved in all their lives, the answer to that question is no. Okay, over here next. Uh. I have heard from two seasoned saints that as long as you have Christ, you can be content and happy on any job. What do you think? <laughs> you can be content, but I doubt you can be happy with just any job. In other words, uh, just as Daryl just said, in Providence, God may put me in some very difficult circumstances work-wise. I don't think Joseph in the prison was, was a very happy camper. <laughs> Nonetheless, he had a giftedness, and the giftedness showed up even there. It says he, the warden put him in charge of the other prisoners. And if you do a study of Joseph's life, you discover that he had this habit of ending up in charge of things all the way through, from sheep to Potiphar's house to the, the prisoners to Egypt. Um, so, you know, when does he become sort of most happy? Well, it's when he's in charge. So yes, I think God calls us to you know, difficult circumstances. We, not, we may not be happy in them, but we can be content that we're in his will and by his grace be strengthened to contend with this you know, difficult set of things that's, that's beset us. You know, there's a premise in the question that I think I want to raise to a conscious level, and that is, is the goal of life happiness? Um, you know, that's, an, that's actually an interesting question to probe. In our culture, uh, pushes us in this direction. After all, our country was created, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. happiness. And now, uh, that's not to downplay that you want life to be good, but if you ask yourself, what am I supposed to measure life by? Am I supposed to measure life because I'm supposed to be happy, or am I supposed to measure life because I'm doing that which I am designed and created to do, which sometimes means in a fallen world being in a fallen and difficult and hard place? Um, so I, part, of the, part of what I would wrestle with in even thinking about the question in those terms is the question of do I um, evaluate happiness at such a level that it actually may get in the way of, of thinking through why God has me here and why he has me doing this. Well, Ephesians 2.10 says that the purpose that we are here for is to carry out good works that God has put us here. So the real question is, am I carrying out those good works? Am I doing it effectively? Um, now, having said that and affirming everything you've said, mm -hmm. let me just speak into, there is a wide swath of Christendom, maybe not wide, but certainly I run into it a lot, 
for some reason, people think you're not supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be miserable as you go through life. <laughs> like if, you're, if you have any joy at all in your work, something must be wrong. You know, like, like somehow we're called to a life of suffering and, and woe. Well, I certainly believe that suffering is going to be part, I mean, Jesus was very clear, anybody who's going to follow him is going to suffer in some way. But to go to work every day miserable when there are options to do other things, to me, is pointless. And, and the, the purpose of the work is not your happiness or your joy, except that for interesting way, God has put the joy in there like a sweetener because he wants you to come back and do that good work again and again and again and again and again. You know, uh, I, I, I hate to, to, to overuse use him, but I, my father is such a great example of somebody who for 60 years did the thing that he loved, which was to teach. But I can tell you there were many aspects of teaching that were very difficult. I mean, he asked, I'm glad Mark Bailey's not here. <laughs> many aspects of being a part of this seminary that were very unpleasant for him. <laughs> But you know, so, so yeah, there's some suffering in that. But he, he would do the thing because to not do it was a kind of a death. It was like, I, I, can't, I can't survive if I don't do this. And even more, there's a purpose to it. If I don't do it, the people don't get what God's given me to give to them. Ephesians 2.10, I call the, the toolkit of God's grace. The reason God gives us our gifts is because he wants to dispense his grace in this world. You don't dispense grace if you go to work and you hate the job and, and, and all of the energy is just to get through the job. Mm -hmm. There ought to be a sense of release like I own this moment. I have authority to do this work because I feel called to it. So I do it as an expression of love to give you the best of what I have. Um, and, and God's grace flows through that. Paul said, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. There are many, many things in this world I can't do, but I myself can write. That's one thing I can do. So I live with a sense of woe is me if I do not write. Yeah, and I, I, I think this is an interesting question because the whole issue of where happiness resides and what, where, where you derive happiness from, and we need a class on happyology alongside laborology, um, it, it is the idea of, you know, most people will gain satisfaction because something serves them and does something for them. It's what I get that makes me happy or maybe how I'm able to kick back and enjoy something that makes me happy. But I do think the scripture is pushing us in a direction where, where happiness is supposed to derive, at least in significant ways, from the way in which I give and participate with others in a functioning community that functions the way God has designed it to be right. managed. And in that sense, there's a lot to be said for thinking through where our happiness comes from. I thank you for that question. That Great was a question. very good question, thank and you. it raises all kinds of interesting uh, issues for us. Thank Next. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is similar to Nancy's. Um, my only hesitation with the whole theology of work and what you're describing is, is using call specifically. Um, as the term for vocational. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, for, for vocational as a whole, whether it be ministerial or, or what we'd say secular, um, just because the force of scripture seems to have a lot of it being salvation and holiness uh, and then specific people. And so I just wondered if you could address that at all. Well, one thing we can do is distinguish between an occupation and a vocation. Mm -hmm. You know, the word vocation and calling is virtually synonymous if you kind of do the word study on it. But, but, but occupation and vocation, those are two different categories. Occupation is just a job title. You know, it's just a job, a role. Uh, and you don't necessarily have your heart in it. But, but vocation has this sense of calling to it that, that you really have been put here to do it. And we do find in this interesting phenomenon that we call human giftedness, that people are drawn to certain kinds of activities that fit them. When they do those things, there's a lot of joy that comes from that, and there's also a lot of effectiveness in what they do. Whereas when they do other things that don't fit them, that's very unproductive. And, uh, and the problem in our culture, and this is a, partly a function of the fall and partly a function of what I said about this whole new thing of knowledge work, we have the majority of people in our culture are not in jobs that fit them. Gallup puts that number at about 70 percent. 
And just think if 70% of the people that you're running into out here are doing work that fundamentally doesn't have their name on it, how much does that cost us economically? Worse, how much does that cost us sort of emotionally, psychically, spiritually? Like, like people are going to, to counseling today because they're depressed and they feel stressed and they got bad relationships at home. How much of that would go away if instead of waking up this morning, as millions, tens of millions of people woke up this morning and said, okay, it's Thursday. Tomorrow's Friday. Thank oh, God. If I can just, <laughs> you know, it's like Chaplain Bill said, if I could just hang in there one more day. Okay, that's right. I'll keep know. myself from killing myself. Well, you know. I knew it would come in back and get us. <laughs> See, and even in seminary, most, most, most people live for the weekend. Seminarians live for reading week, okay? So... <laughs> Where they go on vacation, they don't read. That's the amazing thing. <laughs> so if your job is just an occupation, it's just a means of a paycheck, and your heart is not in it. And, and Paul said, whatever you do, you know, put your heart into it as unto the Lord. And, and, and do your work heartily. Put your heart into it. It's a lot easier to put your heart into work that fits you than just a job that, you know. And, and I'm going to take the question and, and turn it. Um, the observation was that calling is about salvation, but we're back to the question, what are you saved for? Okay, that question never goes away. What am I called to? Okay, right. am I called to merely getting saved, or does getting saved actually make me a more effective member of the creation into which God has placed me? Okay, now if I do it that way, then all of a sudden the whole thing opens up. And, and so the, the, we create dichotomies for ourselves that we don't have to create. I cannot tell you how often, as a challenge to the systematic theology department, we ought, to, we, <laughs> we, we ought to think through how many either ors we create that create problems for ourselves in the way we do our thinking that really are both and. Where the question is not do I have to choose A or B, but the issue is how does A relate to B? How does A connect to B? And so I think calling and salvation and work connect to each other. They're not separate categories. They actually are related to each other. Because if I ask God, if I ask why has God saved me and what kind of person has he called me to be, where he has me, okay, I'm into this conversation. Which raises another question that I think is important worth contemplating, and that is if you're a pastor talking to people in audiences that you're preaching to on a regular basis, and the bulk of their life is spent in the scenarios that we've just spent describing, how prepared are you to address the world that they're living the majority of their life in? And how much time are you giving to thinking about addressing people's lives in those contexts where they are? Not just about who they are as people, but how they are functioning and what God is, has led them to do, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, we can at least agree at that level. So I, I think it's an important question, and I, like I say, I think there are things that are hidden in the way we have even framed the question that keep us from getting uh, perhaps to where the Bible is trying to take us as people. Yes, over here. So all legitimate work is has dignity and is honoring to God, would you, would you also say that all work is of equal eternal value? Is it is as eternally significant to stock shelves at Kroger as it is to translate the Bible into another language? Well, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, that was that either or question. Okay, let's right. go for it. <laughs> let's take the farmer who, who's one one rung back of the person stocking the shelves, but we could use the person stocking the shelves. Does that have eternal significance? No, it has temporal significance, it has temporal value, but it has the value nonetheless. Believe me, if those uh, shelves don't get stocked, there are gonna be a lot of unhappy people here when you go home and, honey, there was nothing on the shelf at the store, so we don't have anything to eat tonight. You know, it, it, it has temporal value, but it has value nonetheless. But of course, anything humans do always has eternal value, precisely because humans themselves have eternal value. And, and every moment that we live is significant because eternity is significant. I think C.S. Lewis said, um, everything matters because eternity matters. And if eternity doesn't matter, nothing matters. Because we are eternal beings. Not that we live 
eternity past, as it were. But, you know, Christ is going to come. We're going to live forever. And, uh, and what happens here and now has, has significant implications for what that experience is like at that point. Yeah, and I, I think that sometimes we downplay the mundane. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, um, and, and that's, that's a problem. I, I like to tell, take people through this exercise. Think about the Wheaties that you eat in the morning, okay? That you sit in front of, you know, and I, I, you know, how many times have you poured a, uh, uh, milk into a, a bowl of Wheaties? Think about what it takes for the Wheaties to get to your table. Just, just pause and think through how many different jobs are involved in that happening. From the person who plants the seed, to the people who help harvest it, to the people who process it, to the people who build the boxes that it goes in, to the people who build the wrappers that the stuff goes in, to the people who pack it and seal it at the top so it becomes unopenable when you want to open it without breaking in a perfect way. I mean, just, just think about all the steps that are involved in that, okay? It's very mundane, it's very everyday. And yet it doesn't happen if there isn't someone at every one of those steps. Um, and, and I think what we have done is we have, we have um, I don't know, I don't know how else to say this. We've desacralized life. Uh, we, ha we have taken the mundane and said, uh, this is really irrelevant. No, actually, we do it every day, day after day after day after day, because it is a relevant part of living. And, and what little piece we may contribute to it may be small in the you know, grand scale of things when MGM goes to film it. But, but it still is significant because if it doesn't happen, someone's impacted by the fact that that's not happening. Or, or someone steps into the gap and says, well, that's not happening, so I'm going to do it uh, either way. Or I'm going to do it better. Uh, that can happen that way. So I, I, I just think we, we don't um, give um, some of the mundane things of life an, a, an, enough credit. Man, if there weren't people around to do mundane things, um, Maybe we wouldn't be called bond slaves of Christ. Well, slaves is the operative word because in, in Colossians and Ephesians particularly, it's to people who are doing the mundane work that Paul precisely spoke. He said, slaves, serve your masters, you know, as you're serving Christ. He saw dignity and value in their work. Did it have eternal value? Well, apparently it must have had eternal value or he wouldn't have spoken to them that way. Next question. Yeah, so kind of similar to what you were talking about before as far as addressing the people in your congregations. Um, I think foundationally one of the issues we wrestle with is that here in America we're so compartmentalized. We have our, you know, this is like my relationship with God box and this is like my everything else box and, and whatnot. And people struggle with seeing that, no, your relationship with God is supposed to transcend every aspect of your life. Um, can you just think of like practical examples, ways that we can kind of help people sort of bridge that kind of get out of that mindset to the point where no, let me there's give you an not example a, that happened to me yesterday yeah. okay yesterday I was at a meeting of an advisory board for the World Evangelical Alliance I met someone I had never met before who's an elder at Irving Bible Church and he works for a company called Geopetra and you look at that name you know I walked into his it was his office that was hosting the meeting and um, I walked in the office and I said that's a strange name for a company well, let me tell you how he thinks about his work he drills oil wells. He drills oil wells in some of the poorest parts of the country, and when they go in to drill the oil, they not only go in to drill the oil, but they also work to provide all kinds of basic core services that people in the south part of Sudan need. Okay, he's actually picking some of the poorest parts of the world to do his work in and provide his services. And around the company in the, in the job that he does, if I can say it that way, although this runs against what we've been saying, but around the job that he does, he's built a, a worldview about how he's ministering to that community as a whole that steps in. Here's what Geo and Petra stand for. Geo stands for the earth. That's where he does his drilling. But Petra stands for the rock of the gospel and he's representing Christ by the way he does his work on the earth. That's how he explained it to me. And I went, this guy gets it, okay? He gets it. He understands that God has him in a place to be doing a certain thing, thing that thousands of people do around the world, but he's doing it with a purpose and a direction and a design, 
in a way of engaging other people and thinking about the way he cares for them by the way he does his work, that they are positively impacted by his presence. And my only prayer is I hope the world has more of those folks. And I hope that in the way we teach and preach in church, we can encourage people to become those kinds of folks. Because those are the kinds of folks the church needs in order to say, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And when people ask, well, how do I see God's love? It's transparent in the way even they do their work. Let me, wait, let me yeah. give you an example uh, to that last question at a sort of a individual pastoral level. In your church, you're going to have people, say, who are employers. And so here's somebody who's getting ready to hire somebody. And because you as a pastor are in their life, you know enough about what they do at work that they volunteer to you the fact that they're getting ready to make a hire uh, in their company. A great pastoral thing to do at that point is to say, wow, can I come pray with you about that hire? See, we, we have to apply the spiritual disciplines to every aspect of life, not just the spiritual aspects of life. We have to take we have to take prayer right into the workplace. So when we're getting ready to hire somebody, we realize I'm getting ready to affect somebody's life and their family and the other employees and all of our customers. Every hire is a pretty important hire. I need to do this prayerfully, mindfully. You know, Lord, show me the right person. Maybe, maybe you know, you, you can help me to have a real uh, impact on this person's life as an employer by the way I make this hire and then by the way I, I manage them. Would we see that person's ownership and management go up a few notches spiritually just by the way you've pastored them in that moment. Another thing that churches often do, for example, in September at Redeemers when the school year begins, they pray for all the teachers at the beginning of the semester making the point that when they give the benediction at the end of the service, the service has actually begun. It hasn't ended. All right. Last question. Uh, my question is in regards to eschatology and original creation. So it's hard for me to understand work outside of conflict. Um, you know, we, we have work because conflict exists and there needs to be progression. How does that look like, um, or what does it look like in a world without sin? Uh, it's, it's very hard for, I guess, as me as a human being to understand life without conflict and working. And I guess that could, there still could be conflict um, in the eschaton, but could you elaborate on what does work look like? Yeah, I'm not sure I accept the premise that wherever there's work, there has to be conflict. I think you had the potential for work before you had the fall. So, uh, so my own quick reaction, short answer is, I'm not sure I accept the premise of that. I do think we have difficulty conceiving of work in a lot of places without there being conflict, but that may, more, may have reflect, be more a reflection of where we've landed than what was originally designed. Okay. Well, and also, I believe that this is a temporary situation. You know, when Christ comes back and, and takes us into glory, I believe that we will continue to do work in glory. You know, I, I realize it's always difficult to speculate about what's going to happen in heaven. But when you look at Revelation and, 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 and Isaiah and other passages, you see a lot of terms in there that make it indicate that people are going to actually do work. Like there's actually going to be streets. Those streets just don't happen. You know, there's actually going to be feasting. Well, you know, those, those meals don't just happen. Apostles going to rule. Yeah, there's going to be ruling. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's work that God has for us to do but without the conflict. I mean, if I'm with you, it's hard for me to imagine what work would look like without conflict, but since work was given from the beginning before the fall, I believe that it is possible to have work, you know, without, certainly without conflict that, that destroys, you know, uh, human beings being the way God's made them, I, I feel very certain even before the fall, Adam and Eve, you know, had some disagreements, they had to negotiate those. That's a great note to end on, isn't it? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time to reflect on why you have us here and why so much of our lives are spent at work. Help us as those who are training for uh, a particular form of ministry to never forget that there are many ways to minister and to encourage all the believers in the priest's that are in any and every place that you have them to do their work well and to serve you well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.